Good morning and happy World Bee Day to everybody joining us. Thank you so much for logging on to the webinar, Pollinating a Dynamic Economy, Prioritizing Pollinators for Better Food Systems. This webinar is being hosted by FAO North America and the Slovenian Embassy to the United States. I'm Elena Clark. I'm here with the FAO Liaison Office in Washington, DC, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we kick things off, I'd just like to go over a few quick housekeeping items for everyone. First things first, just wanted to let everyone know that this event will be live streamed on Twitter and YouTube, and you can find it on the FAO North America um, general website. Um, in case you want to go back and watch again, um, this event link will also be shared with all participants afterwards as well. And additionally, we also will be having a Q&A session after the panel this morning. Um, and we do ask that you keep all answers, or sorry, all questions for our panelists that you'd like to ask in the Q&A box. Um, feel free to introduce yourself, um, tell us where you're joining from today in the chat box, but do try to keep those questions relegated to the Q&A box. So before we get started, um, just wanted to uh, give a quick thank you to the Slovenian Embassy and the United States uh, for helping us put together this event um, and specifically for Mr. Borut Zunik, who was integral in helping coordinate this event. And first to get us started and to kick off this event, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Mr. Vimlendra Sharon. He is the director of FAO's liaison office for North America here, and he has more than two decades of national and international government experience leadership in agricultural, rural development, and food security issues. In addition to his other postings, he served as the VP of the World Food Program Executive Board and as the Asia Group representative on the FAO's program committee. You can find his full bio posted in the chat box if you'd like to learn more. Finlandra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And a uh, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, all our participants and uh, all those who are joining us, because I see from the participants list that people are joining from all across the globe. Uh, uh, in fact, the first wishes which came our way was from Indonesia. So you can see the range of uh, participants joining in. And that is that I think augurs really well for the pollinators and the bees, because that, that shows the level of interest uh, which is there around the globe in ensuring that bees and pollinators of all hue uh, they survive and they, they help us reach our food security goals. As Elena was mentioning, uh, we are hosting this event today in partnership with uh, uh, Embassy of Slovenia and US, and we are extremely grateful for the ambassador and his team at the Slovenian Embassy for having agreed to uh, host this event with us today. I'm also extremely thankful to Dr. Uh, Jose Odgorsek, who's the Slovenian Minister of Agriculture and to Representative uh, Susan Wild, who's the co-chair of the Congressional Apiarian Beekeeper Caucus, who will both be sharing the keynote and the message uh, through a, a video recording. And of course, a very, very warm welcome to Ambassador uh, Kadza, who joins us in person. Uh, he's the Slovenian ambassador to US and also to our esteemed uh, panelists, Abraham uh, Bexler, Jamie Ellis, John Ferry, and Elijah Kozir, who will be all uh, be with us today through the program and share their ideas and concerns uh, with us. Be there to answer uh, hopefully multiple questions and concerns which come from people. And of course, last but not the least, uh, Matt Woody, who is an artist of repute and uh, also one of the uh, biggest champions I have met in my life for bees. So you'll find him uh, doing wonders with his paintbrush while this uh, uh, this webinar is on. So welcome all of you uh, to this uh, webinar. Most of you are aware that uh, pollination is a fundamental process for survival of our ecosystem and much of our uh, wildflowers, of course, but much of our uh, food, nearly 35% of global agriculture line and 75% of the world's food crops get impacted by, uh, by pollinators, be it bees or other, other pollinators. And therefore it was extremely important for us to uh, raise awareness about 
the, uh, the work, the hard work that pollinators put in, in ensuring global food security. Uh, that we are really thankful to uh, Slovenia, which championed this cause uh, and uh, pushed forward for uh, uh, initiating the World Bee Day, uh, which was uh, supported by the membership, a, a unanimous support by membership of FAO, which then found uh, favor with the United Nations and uh, 20th May got declared as the World Bee Day. For those of you who, who like storing these uh, small tidbits facts, um, must tell you that the day was chosen in honor of Anton Hansa, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's a, a pioneer of modern apiculture and born in Slovenia this day in uh, as way back in 1734. So that's, that's, uh, that's who we are honoring today. And of course, we are honoring the bees. So uh, the diversity of bees and other pollinators we are all aware is, is, is falling. And this concerning trend is caused by a number of factors, be it uh, pesticide, insecticides, unsustainable farming practices, monocropping, uh, excessive use of chemicals, uh, climate change, you name it, and all these factors are impacting uh, uh, pollinators today. Uh, it is uh, extremely important that uh, in the agriculture community and in the policymaking community, we really take note of this. Uh, uh, of this crucial fact and uh, take steps to check this decline because pollinators are absolutely essential for the well-being and the food security of the globe. And in this regard, I must uh, commend and give a shout out to Representative Al Blomo, who is the author of the legislation Save America's Pollinators Act, uh, which calls for use of latest scientific research and perspectives to ensure that America's pollinators are protected. Uh, the bill is effectively now specifically calling for establishing a pollinator protection board, uh, cracking down on insecticides that are toxic to pollinators and implementing a state of art uh, monetary net monitoring network for native bees. So I think uh, if, if, if the Congress and the Senate, if, if finally the house does accept and becomes an act, it will, it will be a remarkable feat uh, going forward and a great contribution by the American legislators and policymakers towards uh, a protection of pollinators. Uh, it's, it's, I, I think it's a very timely bill because it's, it's really a time for us to rethink how we, how we relate to nature, how we relate to pollinators and what action we can take to support this tiny but extremely crucial factor in in ensuring millions of livelihoods and the global food security. So uh, hopefully our discussion today uh, will help us, all of us, after we have heard all our panelists and everyone will help all of us to do that rethink and contribute in whatever little way, in whichever fashion we can towards ensuring uh, protection of our planetives. So with that, um, I welcome all of you again to this, uh, what I am sure will be an interesting one hour and uh, hand the floor back to Elena to take the uh, uh, proceeds and forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for those illuminating words, Benladra. That has definitely given us a lot to talk, <laughs> a lot to think about as we continue this webinar and hear more perspectives. Before we turn, <clears throat> turn our attention over to our Slovenian colleagues, I would like to first um, turn our attention to a brief introductory video on World Bee Day that also gives us a little bit of perspective on the country of Slovenia's leadership in apiculture and beekeeping. The video will now play. Thank you. James? Just one moment, James.
you, James, for sharing that video. On that note, uh, we would like to turn the floor over to the Slovenian ambassador to the United States, Tony Kaiser. We are very grateful to have him with us today from the embassy in Washington, DC. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Uh, I'm really happy. Thank you very much, Mr. Director, for encouraging words. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to serve in this beautiful country and to be here uh, today on the World B-Day. Uh, Mr. Director already mentioned uh, the name Anton Jansha, who was born in 1734 and who was actually, uh, so to say, um, uh, cultivating at that time uh, Vienna nobility, how important it is to, to keep uh, the bees. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really happy that uh, we are working together, that we have this uh, possibility to work together with the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, in North America to address the, the critical role of pollinators in ensuring sustainable food production. And uh, it uh, makes me congratulate you and your team, Mr. Director Elena, and everybody who, who has been actually working hard and of course my colleague uh, Boro Junic who was coordinating from from our side uh, so that I'm we are really proud that we have event today uh, for the world be day together with you mr director already mentioned that the pollinators uh, are instrumental uh, i think uh, the number was mentioned 35% of uh, uh, for the 35% of the global crop production and the three quarters of uh, crops that produce fruits and seeds for human consumption depend on pollinators, and that is really very important. Uh, so, as you said, Mr. Director, bees are insignificant in size. They are not big, but they play a really crucial role in helping uh, tackling hunger, poverty, as well as uh, contributing to job creation and the economic growth. Uh, uh, and you already mentioned, uh, I will just uh, shortly repeat that uh, over the past decade, we have seen a dramatic uh, decline of pollinator species. Uh, I think uh, 100 to 1,000 times uh, higher rate of extinction, extinction than normal. Uh, and here we have to look at the human uh, impact, uh, 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 speaking about the monoculture, agriculture, and of course, a wide pesticide, the pe pesticide use. Uh, if the number continued to decline at this rate, uh, this could have really, and is already having uh, wide uh, reaching repercussions. Um, so, uh, uh, without saying, we need to work, uh, continue to work together on a global scale and, uh, of course, coordinate uh, among different uh, countries, organizations, stakeholders uh, working at the global level to reverse the decline uh, trend of pollinators uh, with restrictions of pesticide use and, on the other hand, enhancing biological uh, pest control. <clears throat> I'm really <clears throat> pleased uh, with the Distinguished panel, uh, you will be announcing, you already announced uh, a panel of experts that we have here today uh, for, for this important discussion. Uh, and I'm, I'm particularly proud and happy that we have today Honorable uh, Congresswoman Susan Wild, who I learned was a former beekeeper, uh, but she's still keeping, uh, uh, she's still keeping activities uh, related to the pollinators uh, as she's a co-chair of the Congressional Apiary and Beekeeper Caucus, and we are really looking forward to work with her uh, uh, later on. Uh, I will uh, conclude with my short remarks uh, and uh, just to introduce our uh, Minister uh, for uh, Agriculture, Forestry, and Food, uh, Dr. Joze Podgorsik. I had the honor, I have to say, before I was posted here, I was serving as a state secretary for the government. And at that time, Mr. Podgorsik was my colleague. Uh, he was a state secretary, and then he was promoted to work as a minister. And he's, he's really doing a great job, I have to say. Uh, uh, our minister will talk about the efforts of Slovenia in uh, taking uh, for the protection of pollinators and ensuring sustainable food systems and what the international community together we should do uh, for, for this end. So, with this, I will uh, thank again, and I'm looking forward to the productive debate at this panel. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to be able to participate in this webinar to celebrate the fourth World Bee Day. Special thanks to the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Embassy of the Republic of Slovenia in Washington and all the people who have actively participated into making this event possible. 
We are still fighting the COVID-19 pandemic and it continues to shape our lives. However, the pandemic has also reminded us of the importance of safe, stable and sustainable food chains and systems for the people and the planet that need bees and other pollinators for their survival. By declaring World Bee Day, we wanted to expand and develop the activities for raising awareness in the, of the importance of pollinators, bees and beekeeping, as well as combine the effort of all countries in the world for the common care of bees. However, the main purpose of World Bee Day is to enhance the international cooperation in addressing global issues, such as global food security and, as a result, the elimination of hunger and the preservation of the environment. World Bee Day is highly important for Slovenians. We have always been a beekeeping nation. Beekeeping is part of our rich history and culture, cu cultural heritage. We are very proud of our Carniolan honeybee, which is one of the national symbols. A rich beekeeping heritage is part of our identity and beekeeping is a way of life for many Slovenians. Pollination by bees and other pollinators is one of the most important ecosystem services. It is essential for the functioning of natural and agricultural ecosystems. Therefore, for food production and biodiversity. The UN General Assembly announced 2021 as the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are essential for a healthy diet. Pollination is an essential and free-of-charge service offered to us by nature. Approximately 80% of agricultural crops and wild plants depend on insect pollination. There is an increased need for pollination because of the growing world population. The quantity and quality of crops depend on pollination. Food, which is produced by insect pollination, is the key source of vitamins which are indispensable for human health. Apart from honeybees, we, wild pollinators are also crucial for pollination since they contribute to at least half of the agricultural produce. They are even more efficient and they ensure crops of higher quality due to the better pollination. The events in the recent years have reminded us that food security should not be taken for granted. Pollinators will play an important role in the post-COVID-19 recovery and the transi transition to sustainable agricultural production or food systems that would be more resilient to crises and other challenges. The initiative for World Bee Day was born out of concern for the existence of bees. Its aim is raising awareness about the importance of bees, the fact that they are at risk and the need for responsible action. The 2021 UN Food Systems Summit will take place during the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the EU. Its aim is to pave the way for the necessary change of food systems in order to make them more sustainable, fair and resilient to crises and shocks. It is becoming clearer than ever that their development has taken a dangerous turn. The production method and food consumption that are currently prevalent are economically, socially and environmentally unsustainable. The data of various international organizations shows that in recent years we have witnessed an increase in hunger, the loss of biodiversity, desertification, deforestation, soil depletion and water depletion and pollution. Slovenia will take this opportunity to recall 
the important role of bees and wild pollinators as part of the priorities for a transition to sustainable food systems. In 2021, the International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development, Slovenia and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development will stress the importance of creative economy for the protection of bees and other pollinators. Architects, designers, writers and filmmakers put bee houses in urban centers and the necessity of bee protection in the mind of people. They are more successful at it than any other social or economic activity. I would like to conclude by mention, mentioning another important activity that will take place at the global level. Slovenia will award the Golden Bee Award to promote and support the inno innovation and excellence of individuals and organizations that have significantly contributed to the protection of bees and the awareness raising of the importance of bees and other pollinators. It is our ambition to make the Golden Bee Award the most recognizable award for international achievements in the field of bees and other pollinators. I was, also, I was also pleased to learn that this year the Beekeeping Academy of Slovenia has successfully organized two online beekeeping courses for American beekeepers. Let me finish by expressing our wish that the bilateral relations between our countries will deepen even further and that this event is the first step towards an enhanced cooperation especially in the field of beekeeping. Thank, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Minister Podgorsek and to Ambassador Kaiser for the great introductions and opening remarks as well. Um, I think I speak for everyone and I say it's been extremely helpful to hear background from both of you considering your storied careers in agriculture and, and pollination and related fields. I'm very much looking forward to uh, continuing this collaboration between our two countries as well on these important issues and look forward to, to seeing how the Golden Bee Award uh, continues to, to progress. That's very exciting as well. Before we move on um, to our panel discussion um, and to introducing the live artwork from Matt Willie today, uh, we have one last opening remark, keynote speech uh, from representative Susan Wilds. Um, though she cannot be with us in person today due to the demanding legislative schedule, she has graciously sent um, video remarks as well. Um, as a little bit of background, uh, I think we had already mentioned, but Representative Wild started the Congressional Apiary and Beekeepers Caucus and is a former beekeeper herself. So I look forward to, to hearing her remarks. Um, if we could play the video now, James, that would be fantastic. Thank you. everybody. This is Congresswoman Susan Wild representing Pennsylvania's 7th District, and it is a pleasure to express my support for building awareness of the essential role that pollinators play in sustaining human life. Without pollinators, quite simply, humans would go hungry. It is that simple. Today, half of native bee populations in North America are believed to be declining. Honeybees in the United States decreased by 60% between 1947 and 2008, and bee colonies per hectare have declined by 90% since 1962. Despite this reality, policymakers for far too long have not adequately heeded the warnings of scientists when faced with the alarming decline of the native bee populations and other pollinator populations. U.S. agriculture is heavily dependent on pollinating bees. Honey bees serve as primary pollinators for 90 to 100% of all apples, plums, cherries, almonds, macadamia nuts, blueberries, oranges, grapefruit, tangerines, cantaloupes, and cucumbers that are produced in the United States, and as primary or supplementary pollinators 
in the production of peaches, peanuts, strawberries, grain and seed crops, soybeans, melons, lemons, and pumpkins. A single bee colony can pollinate 300 million flowers each day. That translates to an annual estimated value of $12.4 billion. As we look at the state of bee and pollinator populations today, it is clear, however, that we must do more to build genuinely sustainable models of agriculture and development that seek to avoid the use of harmful chemicals on a mass scale. To refuse to do so would be to accept unacceptably high environmental and social costs for our biodiversity, for the health of farmers and other agricultural workers, for consumers and for the future of human life. In my own community, in Pennsylvania's Greater Lehigh Valley, I am proud to count among my constituents some extraordinary small family farmers who are driven every single day by their dedication to getting the highest quality, most sustainable food to market. That's the spirit and mindset that I believe that we must champion and prioritize never more so than when it comes to ensuring healthy bee populations. And as a former beekeeper myself, I will always have a personal passion for this issue. In Congress, I founded the Congressional Apiary Caucus. And over the coming weeks and months, I look forward to continuing to work on building awareness here in the United States and hopefully with officials across the globe as well. Thank you so much, and I wish you all a healthy and peaceful World Bee Day. Thank you so much, Representative Wild. It's great to have such a fantastic advocate in the halls of Congress for beekeepers. And I think all of these discussions have set a great foundation for our panelists going forward. Um, and I, I look forward to building on these ideas. Uh, but to give us a little bit of a break and to add some, some levity um, in addition to these high level intellectual conversations we're having here, we now turn to Mr. Matt Willie, um, who is the founder and muralist for Good of the Hive. He will be, um, I'll let him, uh, you know, introduce his mission a little bit. Um, but just to give you a bit of background, he's created uh, 32 murals so far and installations with over 85,000 hand-painted bees. Um, and he'll, he has graciously agreed to paint a bee for us today, which you'll be able to see as the panel continues. Um, we'll be keeping tabs on his progress and you'll be able, able to watch his painting process. So I think that'll be a real treat, but Matt, I'll turn the floor over to you for a moment. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm, I first worked with or even presented, I think it was 2017, at the round table with Vim Lindra, and that was when I knew nothing. I mean, I really knew nothing about all of this work and pollination, so you guys have taught me so much as I've been able to watch everything happened around World Bee Day and what everybody's doing at the UN. Um, one quick correction, I'm at 8,500 bees so far on my way to 50,000, not 80,000, <laughs> okay. I just like, well, yeah. So I am an artist, I'm an act, art activist, and I founded an organization called The Good of the Hive in 2015. And the goal at the time was that I would personally hand paint 50,000 individual honeybees in murals and installations around the world. Now the 50,000 number is an average in a healthy hive. I just wanted to pick a nice round number. And um, the mission of the good of the hive is to get people curious about the planet we live on uh, through the lens of art, bees, and storytelling. And it started years ago, basically like what everybody's talking about is this need to share with everyone the importance of these, these pollinators and bees. Um, and it has blossomed into so much more. The vision for the good of the hive now is 
um, if this all goes as planned for the 50,000, is a world filled with people that see and experience the connectedness of all things. Because although it was meeting one bee on the floor for two hours where I created this connection with her, I saw her in a way I'd never seen a bee before. There was a change in me. And that has unfolded for me to understand what everybody is talking about, that there is pollination, but that is directly linked to soil, food, water systems, human health, all of this is connected. And the pollinators, especially the honeybee for me, is such a great entryway into that world for people. Because I, I'm not like the, the pollinators behind me right here, any of the ones I've painted in the 32 murals from San Diego to Nebraska to the UK to DC, they're not pollinating anything. They're a symbol. So the bee to her hive is us to our world. And this whole project, which is at 8,500 bees at this point in six years on its way to 50,000 is one painting. It's one project connecting us all. The idea is that it will take 15 more years or 20 more years, however long it takes for all of us to have one place we can go to say, okay, this is continuing, this conversation, this working toward the solution, there's, there's a spot to go. So this piece behind me is actually the conversation piece. That's the title. And it began at last year at the Albany State Capitol when we were lobbying to get the bill to the floor called the Birds and the Bees Protection Act. And this will put a ban on certain use of neonicotinoids in New York State, which would be the first in the US to do this. And so I offered my skills, we brought it in and, and I am committing, this painting isn't done, and I'm committing to keep painting pollinators at different events like this one here or at other things as the conversation continues until that bill is passed. So I thought it was appropriate to just add a pollinator for World Bee Day. I'm gonna add a honeybee um, over here while the rest of the talk is going on. So hopefully in about 30 or 40 minutes, we'll have another bee in the world. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt, for sharing your uplifting message and, and mission with us. I think that sets a a great starting point for us for our for our conversation um, incidentally with having the, your conversation piece in the background um, so to continue with your metaphor of each of us being um, a sort of be to our own hive as being the world we're going to turn our our attention over to our panelists or should i say our our bees um, so our first panelist um, that we are going to to chat with today is um Abram Bixler, who is joining us from FAO headquarters in Rome. Um, and so we're grateful to have him here at this hour. Um, and just to give you um, a little bit of background about, about the panel going forward, it's going to be around 20 to 30 minutes, and we'll have about two minutes for each, um, each answer, two questions per panelist. Um, our other panelists joining us today will be Ladea Kozir, who is the founder of Circular Change. Um, so she'll be bringing a global economics perspective um, to discuss how bees and pollinators can tie into the economy. We also have Mr. John Ferry, who is the apiarist for the colonies at Mount Vernon and at the Kennedy Center, and is also the president of the Northern Virginia Beekeeper Beekeepers Association. Um, and then we have Mr. Jamie Ellis, who is the director of the University of Florida's Honeybee Research and Extension Laboratory. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining us, and I look forward to a very fruitful discussion going forward. As mentioned, Abram, we will start with you. Um, first question, uh, given your, your background, I was hoping you could provide us a little bit of information on how the increasingly industrialized nature of agriculture has contributed or intersected with the decline of our pollinators and their population. Excellent, thank you, Elaine. It's very nice to be here. Hello, everybody, and greetings from Rome, where we just celebrated um, at headquarters the World Bee Day. Had a lot of 
panelists and high level presentations. And uh, Elena, that's a really important question. As, as many of our speakers have already mentioned, um, industrialized agriculture has really driven declines in, in pollinators. And I think it's important to note that when we talk about pollinators, um, honeybees are incredibly important, especially in, in large um, industrialized, but, but also just in a large part because of their, their efficiency for pollination. But there are, there are many, many different species of, of pollinators that we depend on. There's over 20,000 species of bees alone, in addition to the, the honeybees, plus the mammals, the, the birds, the bats, um, different, different uh, other different types of insects as well. And, um, you know, when we talk about some of the drivers of decline of, of pollinators, um, one, of the, one of the big drivers has been habitat loss, that as in many parts of the world, agriculture has become more industrialized, it's become bigger, monocultures have been been planted, fields have gotten larger, uh, you lose diversity. You lose diversity of, of important habitat, important nectar and floral resources for, for pollinators. You lose habitat for, for the birds, for their insects, for bats as well. So that's a, that's a big driver. Um, you know, intensification of agriculture has often been on the heels of, of unsustainable use of pesticides as well. And over and, and unsustainable use is um, often a part of monoculture and, and monocropping that, that causes decline. Um, another, another thing is that as fields and as farms and as production has gotten bigger, we've needed to depend more on managed pollinators, managed honeybees. And um, pests and diseases are, are a big issue as as hives move, as they migrate, there's the, the possibility of, of pest and disease transfer as well. And that's, you know, as, as agriculture becomes larger, that's a, that's a real possibility. And also I think a really another important um, factor from industrialized agriculture is that, that agriculture has really, um, has a very, very large carbon footprint, has, has um, has driven climate change in, in many ways. And that climate change is also a factor in um, really threatening our bees and our pollinators. But the good news is that agriculture can also help to reverse climate change as well. So there is there is um, good news for that. But um, all in all, some of those, those factors and their complex interactions um, have caused, has, have caused have become threats to, to bees and pollinators and are, are causing decline in certain parts of the world. Thank you for that thoughtful analysis, Abram. Um, I think you brought up some, some very crucial points. Um, I'd like to expand a little bit more on, on the good news, uh, naturally, that, that you touched upon there. Um, so through your work at the Plant Production and Protection Division, or um, just your your work and, and research generally. Um, is there any good news going forward? Um, you know, any promising nature-based sustainable agriculture practices or, or policies that, you know, seem to be helping assist in, in combating this habitat loss and, and monoculture and loss of diversity going forward? Yeah, there are. Um, FAO has been working in many of these approaches with, with many of our partners globally, you know, just, just looking at agricultural practices making a difference. One of the ones that comes to mind that, that our team works in is, is that of agroecology. And agroecology takes a, it takes a, a systems approach to not only production, but the marketing, the consumption of food. It has components. Um, and one thing I failed to mention too is just that diets play a very important part in why uh, agriculture has become intensified and agroecology steps back and it looks at diet. It looks at cultural and hair, cultural and food traditions. Um, agroecology takes a, it's a transformative approach to food systems that, that looks at economics. It looks at 
production approaches, the environmental sustainability issues and the social sustainability issues. And one of the key components of agroecology is that of diversification. Um, and so I talked a bit about how monocropping and monoculture and the increasing size of farms is a problem. Diversification is, is a really important principle or, or element of, of agroecology. Um, another, another exciting thing that we're seeing that, that's, that's part of sustainable agriculture, it's part of agroecology, is that of co-creation and sharing of knowledge. And um, this, this is about science and local indigenous knowledge researchers working together in a particular context to create solutions that are sustainable across the three dimensions. And we heard um, in, in our World Bee Day event just a few hours ago, um, we had a panelist, Frank Roy from Northeast India, who talked about local and indigenous knowledge and incorporating those into sustainable agricultural systems and, and relocalizing the food systems with that. Um, and, and along with that, you know, is a, a wealth of diversification that, that often comes. And that touches on another important and exciting uh, sustainable agricultural practice is that when we take more of a landscape approach, when we look at the connectivity between our agricultural fields or plots and the broader landscape, the watershed, um, the surrounding hedgerows, the forest, and we become cognizant of that, then we, then we, we start to see ways that those benefit pollinators. And, and we start to see ways to better protect and ensure that there's the connectivity that, that many of the wild pollinators need um, in order to thrive and survive. And, um, you know, in the, so that's, that's from a global perspective. In, in looking at a North American perspective, the work that's happening with regenerative agriculture, with a focus on soil health, with a focus on diversification of cover cropping and diversification of crops, um, you're seeing some of, of the, the ways that um, we can start to reverse some of the threats and, and reverse some of the decline of pollinators and bees. So we have to, you know, I think one of the bottom lines is we have to think holistically about agriculture. We have to think about context and we need to think about how do people, um, how, what is their part in that? How do we co-create knowledge together um, and realize that there's no silver bullets and that we minimize trade-offs and we, we try to optimize the system in a holistic, a diversified manner. Yes, thank you, Abram, for, for that elaboration. And, you know, in keeping with your theme of attacking these issues from a, from a holistic approach, if we parse it down from the global and the macro level, is there anything that anyone who doesn't work in these fields and isn't themselves a beekeeper or, you know, a, a pollination uh, specialist, is there anything that, that we can individually do to help diversify our, our ecosystems and help move forward um, yep. and assist in these pollination efforts? It's a, it's a great question. So I've kind of spoken from the global perspective and to that effect, um, I'd be remiss to, to say, or to not say that FAO through the International Pollinators Initiative two, where we are working in, in these, um, these areas to, to preserve and sustainably use pollinators, but there's, there's things that everybody can use or can do wherever you're at. Um, one is that if you have a yard, if you have uh, any place that could be suitable for pollinators, then, then habitat, not, not only conservation, but um, plant a garden, leave your hedgerows. You know, if you're, if you're in a place and, and um, you can leave the, the weeds in, in your garden or the weeds sometimes in your lawn, those can, can serve an important function. Um, for youth, I'm excited to, to say that today, uh, we just released the Youth and United Nations Global Alliance Challenge Badge on Pollinators. So it's chock full of activities that, that youth from you know, all ages can do to learn about pollinators, to make a difference, um, to advocate, to your, your policymakers about the importance of pollinators. Um, and, um, you know, another thing that, that we learned about in our World Bee Day is, is um, Professor Jane Stout talked about the All-Ireland Plan of Action on Pollinators. 
and the the lessons learned after five years and um it's chock full of of useful things that that gardeners can do useful things that citizens can do and one of the most important and, and i think effective things is that we we as citizens can vote with our dollars so the the food that you purchase and consume um you know that was a lot of those were were produced with the need of pollinators to help increase the yield and also the quality and so you know learn about the food that you're you're consuming or purchasing and purchase food that is raised in sustainable ways that the benefit and promote pollinators like we talked about with diversity and with an emphasis on soil health and a broader landscape view and also on the the health and and well-being and livelihoods of the people producing it absolutely well that's very helpful to me and i hope that's helpful to our audience as well to get that background um, some counterintuitive knowledge there that I would have, you know, never thought about keeping keeping weeds around. I think we're all taught the opposite. So it, it's good to to have this this conversation um, and to hear that and, and to have uh, great advocates like you and great programs like the International Pollinators Initiative and look forward to seeing that progress as well. Um, if we could stay on the um, the research topic, but turn our gaze over um, stateside, we will uh, shift over to uh, Mr. Jamie Ellis at the University of Florida. Thank you, Abram, for, for all of your comments and background there. If Jamie could join us on the screen. All right, there he is. Welcome, Jamie. Um, again, he is the director of the Honey Bee Research and Extension Laboratory at the University of Florida. Um, and obviously, Florida um, is one of the states most known for their for their beekeeping and their agriculture. Um, and if we could just jump off of our conversation with Abram a little bit, um, keeping on the, the topic of, of knowledge sharing and, and solution creation. Um, in your research um, and your work at the UF Honey Bee Lab, um, we know and we've all come to know that the issues within pollination, pollinator decline and within um, honeybee communities is not all external based off of, you know, the agriculture industry, climate change, and, and all of the, the myriad of issues that, that Abram graciously outlined for us, but there are internal issues such as, you know, CCD, pollinator collapse, disease, um, and, and other pests. Um, and I was hoping you could give us a little bit of background on your work with those issues, and if there are, um, if you could identify any uh, promising conservation efforts um, on these topics or or any other related topics that are, are threatening to the honeybee populations. Sure, Elena, and thank you so much to the FAO and the Slovenia and Embassy for hosting this very important event. I've been very fortunate to visit uh, Slovenia. What an amazing country with a great rich beekeeping tradition. So I can't think of a better partner to for the FAO to be doing this World Bee Day. So happy World Bee Day to everyone. So I've been keeping bees since I was 12, and that's over three decades now, just three decades. And I absolutely love keeping bees. I, I love being a beekeeper. I've, I've really just been enthralled with it over the decades, but I will admit it's difficult to do because there are a lot of things that bees face. You've already heard about some of the stressors that have been mentioned. I'm just going to kind of start big and zoom in. And as it was already mentioned, there's about 20,000 species of bees on the planet. Only nine to 11 of those, depending on who you ask, only about nine to 11 of those are honeybees. And only one of those honeybee species is the one that's the predominant one used around the world. It's, it's distributions in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and a little bit of Western Asia. So this bee, Apis mellifera, has been spread around the world and is managed. And, and this particular species has somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 subspecies or races. Now, Due to its spread around the world, it's encountered a lot of diseases and pests. Perhaps the most notable of those is a mite that gets on the outside of the bee's body and feeds on its fat bodies. This particular mite, uh, Varroa, spreads a number of pathogens to bees. And so the Varroa and these pathogens act together to just absolutely destroy colonies. When, as beekeepers, we spend a lot of our time trying to control Varroa, but they also face 
nutritional issues, queen quality issues, virus issues. There's no doubt climate's playing a role. When you survey beekeepers, all of these issues come out as major issues. Now, with our managed honeybee populations taking such uh, significant hits, obviously it's important that folks like us at the University of Florida, other folks around the world try to study and figure out what's killing bees and how we can mitigate those issues. Uh, Elena, you specifically asked about conservation efforts. One of the things is that everybody right now is so focused on managed honeybees, we forget that this thing is a native species in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, that it has a distribution over these three areas. And some of these 30 to 35 subspecies I mentioned earlier are, are possibly extinct or threatened. So part of the conservation work that needs to be done now is just, just um, determining the conservation status of these bees. I'm an absolute believer that the answer to the issues that we are having in the managed honeybee population today, the answer I believe is in the wild population of honeybees in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And it would be a tremendous travesty to see these populations go down to lose some of these subspecies that very well may hold the key to varroa resistance or virus resistance. So my team and I and other teams around the country and the world for that matter, are trying to take those first important steps in identifying the conservation needs for these wild honeybee populations with a long-term goal of improving the sustainability of our beekeeping and, and, and the agriculture and the human populations and the ecosystem that all of, all of the honeybees and the other pollinators support. Thank you for providing those, those details, Jamie, and um, especially for the focus on, on wild bees. I know that's not typically you know, what we focus on on the academic discussions or, or the public discourse is typically on you know, kept bees and in our domestic hives here. So that's, that's very fascinating. And a lot of us wouldn't have, have likely heard about this if we weren't talking to you today. Um, so in discussion on your research at the University of Florida and all of these important research efforts. Um, obviously, being a university, you have access to a lot of young people who might be interested in these issues or in adjacent issues, but aren't exactly familiar with, with beekeeping or, or the issues of that surround pollinators. Um, so I was just curious if you could provide us a little bit of background as to what the level of, of interest is um, from students and, and how particularly um, you're able to uh, bring in students and get them engaged in these important issues since obviously we have to have the, the next generation engaged to, to keep working on these um, crucial efforts. Sure, it'll be my pleasure to speak to that. So, so I mentioned earlier that, I, that I'm a 31 year beekeeper, right? So I've been keeping bees since I was 12. And, and when I was early in my career at the university, when, when pollinators were only one of those things that was just kind of a passing fancy, folks did not talk about the importance of pollinators much. In 2006, the year I got hired at the University of Florida, all of that changed. There was this groundswell in pollinator advocacy and a general public understanding of the importance of pollinators, not just here in the US, but all around the world. And Elena, along with that public understanding came a flood of young people who want to be involved in saving pollinators. I have been absolutely flabbergasted, stunned at the number of undergraduate students, graduate students, high school students, middle school students, and even uh, um, elementary school students who are aware of pollinators. And so here at the University of Florida, we really take two approaches to try to ensure that next generation of bee scientists. And it's a little difficult to say next generation because you and I both know that young folks are powerful advocates even now. They don't even have to wait. So we do that primarily through two different avenues. The first of those is instruction at the University of Florida and my sister universities all around the US and the world for that matter. We offer courses in bees, beekeeping, pollination, ecology. Here at UF, we already offer five courses on honeybees and we're planning to offer three more in the next few years. That will be eight courses, as, as many courses as probably offered anywhere else in the world, just on pollinators. So we, we have an amazing interest in graduate students. If I had an unlimited supply of money, I'd be able to train dozens of grad students every year. There's just that many 
students interested. Outside of the university system, though, we also address this through our extension programming. That's where we take that information to the general public. And in the U.S., we have programs, youth programs such as 4-H, FFA, uh, lots of programs. We're getting into schools. Schools are coming to us. It is an absolutely amazing to me at the interest of young folks. And I will tell you, and, and I will say this and believe it, I'm not just saying this because I'm on an FAO panel and I think it's the right thing to say. I, I cannot believe the talent that's behind us right now. I, I'm, I'm a fervent believer in the next generation coming around and, and being smarter, faster, and more together than we are even today. And I'm absolutely confident that that generation is going to help us address the issues. So people are falling over themselves to be involved with pollinators these days. Universities like ours, uh, groups like yours uh, around the world are absolutely coming together to make it possible for young folks to be involved. And let's face it, they're going to solve these issues, I have no doubt. Well, that's certainly reassuring to hear and definitely encouraging to know that you have all of these educational resources available, but, but even more reassuring to hear that it's not pulling teeth to get young people involved and there's already that existing excitement from, from the youth and, and that is uh, great to hear from us and um, I'm glad that we have such great experts, you know, at the forefront leading this charge. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing that perspective, Jamie, and, and we look forward to hearing more and seeing more of the great work out of the University of Florida and your next generation of, of beekeepers and, and researchers there. So before we turn on, turn over, sorry, to our next panelist, John Ferry, I would just like to give a, a quick shout out to, to Matt Woolley. Um, I know we're all fascinated watching the bee come alive there. He's looking great. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you again, Jamie. Um, as mentioned, we are going to uh, drill down um, over to the more local level in Washington, DC um, and speak to Mr. John Ferry, who is the beekeeper for the colonies at Mount Vernon and at the Kennedy Center, in addition to being um, the president of the Northern Virginia beekeepers. Um, we have some photos that we'd like to show just to give everyone a visual of the Kennedy Center and Mount Vernon and their bee colonies. Since um, I know it's a little hard to picture, especially if you're from DC, um, thinking of, uh, you know, beehives being up there. So um, John, if you could, I, I believe this is the roof, if you could help us out a little bit. Is that the roof of the Kennedy Center we're looking at? Yes, it is. Uh, and for those who don't know, the, this is the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. It's a living memorial to Pre uh, President uh, John F. Kennedy uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, on the left, uh, you see a picture of uh, some of my hives there looking out across uh, Washington towards the uh, uh, Washington Monument in the background there. And you can see the roofs of uh, the Lincoln Memorial and Jefferson Memorial to the side. And on a beautiful day, uh, last December, this was taken. And then uh, this is another shot of my hives on the roof, um, looking over towards uh, Arlington National Cemetery uh, across the Potomac River uh, towards the Virginia side. And, and if we could go to the next slide, I think we have Mount Vernon as well. Yeah. Uh, just in, yeah, could you give us a geographic location there? Yeah, this is the, and, uh, and also for those who don't know, Mount Vernon uh, Estate is the uh, home of uh, 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 the United States uh, first president, George Washington. And uh, it's an honor to be there too. And this is a, a look at some of my haphazard looking hives there. <laughs> no, they, they look very healthy to me. Looks great. Awesome, all right, I think we're all set there. So thank you for, for walking us through that and, and for sharing the background on, on the highs and their, and their location. Um, I know most of us don't typically think of historical sites and, and concert halls as being the traditional location for a working beehive. Um, so I was just hoping you could give us a little bit of information as to how you kind of sought out that opportunity and made that happen. Um, you know, for those of us who might be considering 
um, urban beekeeping or, or opening up our, our own personal beehive but aren't sure it's the correct space, I think this would be helpful for people to hear kind of how you made that happen and, and any advice to, to anyone. Obviously there's there's only one Mount Vernon and one Kennedy Center, but you know, uh, something adjacent uh, along those lines could, could be happening. <laughs> you but, never know. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Mount Vernon was uh, looking for a new beekeeper to replace someone that left. And a friend of mine knew about it and asked me if I was interested. And I was very excited at that prospect. Uh, with the Kennedy Center, I, I simply asked. Um, that sounds simple, but the key is to ask the right person. And uh, that is the hard part. Um, mm -hmm. I met the right person at a friend's party um, and she was open to the idea and, 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 and helped me get started there. Uh, that woman is now retired and just completed her first year of beekeeping. <laughs> so I, I, I helped convert one more beekeeper there. Um, the, uh, the differences uh, between the two locations, um, it depends if you're a city person or a country person, but uh, there's much beauty in each of these locations. On the roof of the Kennedy Center, looking over Washington, I think the most beautiful city in the country, uh, seeing the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, all the cherry trees around the Tyler Basin, it's, it's just beautiful. Um, then. I drive over to Mount Vernon to check those bees, the gardens, the lawns, the river, the trees, and of course the history. Uh, I'm very lucky to be a beekeeper to both of these very important and historic locations. Um, from a beekeeping perspective, uh, working on the roof has its challenges uh, of being hotter and having severe winds. Uh, I have to stra strap those hives down. Uh, I, in the beginning, I did have uh, winds blow the covers off my hives and realized that wasn't going to work. <laughs> uh, there are more uh, logistics involved uh, on the roof and moving equipment and down. Um, the good side is that I don't have any pests, uh, uh, pests being like uh, mice or uh, skunks um, or small hive beetle for that matter too. I, I do, of course, have uh, the Varroa mite, which uh, uh, Mr. Ellis spoke of, um, that infects uh, all of our hives everywhere and is a, a major pest. Mm -hmm. um, at Mount Vernon, I am just inside the tree line, as you saw from the picture. So I'm shaded and much cooler, and I park my car about 20 feet from the hives, so I'm able to uh, easily move equipment in and out. and uh, and I do have some pests at Mount Vernon. I do have skunks and uh, mice and <laughs> things like that. So each, there are pros and cons to each of them, of course. Uh, I operate in both locations as a volunteer. Uh, at Mount Vernon, I volunteer my bees to them as pollinators to their gardens and orchards and, and the farm there. At the Kennedy Center, I. I see the bees as being ambassadors to the beekeeping world and to the plight of the mighty bee. So that, that's how I see it. I think that's a, a great way to frame it. And I think you offered some, some great advice that's uh, universal, you know, even, even outside of beekeeping, just, just to ask, just to, to get started. So um, I think yeah. that can apply to, to anyone who's, you know, perhaps looking to, to get involved with beekeeping, just to, just to test it out themselves and see if it works. Um, I was hoping you could expand a little bit on the difference between suburban and, and urban beekeeping. Of course, in your, your work with the Northern Virginia beekeepers, I assume that is uh, primarily suburban beekeeping. And I know you do um, a lot of extraction from, from homes with, with beehives that have set up shop in, in someone's home or, or something of that nature. And I'll, uh, you're welcome to, to expand on, on your work there as well. Um, but just a, a little bit of information as to the different challenges or, or the different benefits. Well, um, as, a, um, as a, a beekeeping uh, association uh, serving the community and as individual beekeepers that we are, uh, we try to make ourselves known through community outreach and by going to fairs, gardening events, craft fairs and such. Uh, we also try to make ourselves known to police and fire to be able to uh, help in public uh, bee swarm situations. 
Um, and then, we, you know, speaking to children in schools helps us gain their confidence uh, that bees are a good thing and not to be afraid of. Then uh, they spread that news to their parents. <laughs> um, our, our association also teaches uh, beginning beekeeping classes each winter. Um, and not, not uh, quite to the extent of uh, Mr. Ellis does at the university, but uh, we, we do offer beginning beekeeping classes and, and we sell those out each year. Um, we, there's a strong, strong uh, uh, request uh, for that. Um, you know, right now I'm mentoring uh, several people. Um, one gentleman actually is a recently retired four-star admiral uh, he became interested after several conversations I had with him and his wife. Um, but uh, with him, though, I, I have to help him a little bit more than I do others, as he's still quite a busy man. Uh, uh, and a, a woman I work with, too, right now is a young mother who teaches preschool. And uh, she told me it's been a lot, lifelong interest for her and that she feels uh, now is the right time to get started. So she told me that she even had uh, bees and honey as part of her uh, uh, wedding theme. <laughs> oh, wow. But uh, yeah, when I, uh, when I was uh, being given my volunteer tour of the Kennedy Center, um, I was introduced to the build, uh, as the building beekeeper uh, to this elderly woman, also a volunteer. Uh, she looks at me and says, what are you going to do? Kill them? This was a teaching moment. So <laughs> I, um, I don't know how much influence I had her, on her, but uh, hopefully left her with some positive thoughts on bees. And, uh, but uh, as a friend uh, said to me, we have, we have to be a solution and an asset. We have to pivot people from being frayed to impressed and being an advocate for the bees. If you aren't, if you aren't doing uh, outreach, uh, you're not taking care of your bees. We need to be part of the community. And that's our message. I think that's a, a great way to put it. And it seems like you're uh, having a lot of success with doing a, a sort of direct outreach with the community with the, the ground up building trust, you know, at very young levels going in and and speaking at schools, is it primarily elementary schools, high schools, yeah, and, and do you ever do one elementary? Primarily, primarily elementary. I, I did B talks uh, to all my uh, children's classes as they were growing up, and uh, and unfortunately those stopped about the fifth grade uh, when the teachers said that it didn't work uh, work into their curriculum. <laughs> But the, the younger classes uh, loved having me there. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure that's very informational and a nice break from, you know, the typical arithmetic and uh, social studies that you're learning in, in elementary school. I would have loved that. Um, <laughs> so is there, um, you know, anything that perhaps any of your recently joined members have shared with you about what ultimately, um, you know, convinced them to, to get involved or join? Uh, I, we uh, talk to uh, people all the time and, you know, we try to be advocates and, and engage people in conversation. Beekeeping is a great conversation starter. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, working with a four-star admiral and, uh, and the young teacher, um, it's, it, it's been in the back of their minds and, uh, and they finally took the plunge. Uh, and also, you know, they hear about bees in the news and such, and uh, and they come across us and, uh, and 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 engage us in conversation, and we get we get their uh, we get their energy going on the beekeeping side. Well, it sounds like you've got great momentum, and uh, it seems like it's it's only building with your classes continuing to sell out. So I I wish you the best of luck and uh, look forward to. To hopefully getting to try some of that Kennedy Center honey one day, perhaps. Sure. Maybe. <laughs> awesome. I'm well, happy to. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much for for sharing your your experience and and all of that very helpful background with us, John. It's been been great to see. And it looks like our bee is continuing to to come along well over there. He's got a a wing forming too. What are we? How far through this bee would you say we are, Matt? 
I'm pretty, I mean, I'm not too far from done. I got some details to do. It's, I think the camera is sort of making it look longer than it is. So <laughs> you have those particular people imagine her a little bit tighter, but, um, but yeah, it's coming along a little bit more to go. No, it, it looks great. All right. Well, we'll come back to you in a second. And now we are going to turn to our last, but certainly not least panelist, Ladea Kosir. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, <laughs> Ladea is joining us uh, from Slovenia. So uh, thank you for being here this, uh, this late in, in the evening for you. I'm sure you wanted to wind down your professional day. So we appreciate you taking the time um, and, and providing us with this great global economics perspective. Um, and I, I would just like to give everyone a little bit of additional information. You know, for those who, who aren't familiar, um, and correct me if I'm off here in the description, um, a circular economy and what circular change your organization, you know, is generally looking to promote is, is focusing on, on waste reduction and, and conservation in the economy. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit, um, you know, any specific examples of how, um, you know, bees can, can fit into, and pollinators can, can fit into that economy and how they can, um, you know, find, find an entry point, as I know that's what you, that's a, a key, service that your organization provides is, is helping um, organizations and, and governments, you know, adopt the circular change model. How, how can pollinators, both individual and larger organizations, research groups, how can they come into the uh, circular economy and, and benefit off of that and, and provide benefits back? Thank you, Elena, and I'm super happy and privileged being with you here today. Uh, I will just start because I'm so inspired by, by everything what I have heard and having met you back there in the background uh, drawing the bee, it's super exciting. Uh, I would like to say something what, what came to my mind because I'm coming from Slovenia and as I wrote already in the chat, uh, we are the only country with love in its name, but there is another number that came to my mind because we are 2 million people altogether. And today when we are talking about bees, and I have Googled a little bit because I'm not an expert as the others today are, and I have found that uh, the honey bee colony can be up to 60,000 or even more. Uh, what means that we here in Slovenia, by being 2 million people, if we were bees, we were for around 30 colonies only. So <laughs> that, that is uh, really interesting when, when you mm, start thinking about the role of the humans, of the nations and the bees compared to the United States and so on. So just to open the floor with this kind of thinking, how, uh, how uh, tiny is our population and how unimportant sometimes we humans are, but we are putting us in the center. And back to your question, yes, I'm the founder of Circular Change. This is the private nonprofit organization focusing on circular economy, but I'm wearing several hats. I'm also the chair of European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform in Brussels, collaborating with system science in Austria, uh, with university in Kyoto and so on and so on. So like a bee running around, flying around, now not, we are in front of the screen. So uh, to circular economy, yes, and to that, what does it mean or what it brings um, also uh, to the beekeepers and to, to others engaged into, let's call it this um, industry. Uh, so circular economy is not about waste. Of course, uh, what we are aiming is uh, to prevent waste and to use everything what has been considered as a waste as something uh, very valuable and what we can still reuse or integrate back into the system. Uh, so it is not something what is detached from our daily life nor from our businesses. So when we talk about circular economy, how we understand it, it's about maintaining value uh, in the production cycle as well as in consumption cycle for as long as possible. So having this different attitude towards whatever we produce or towards whatever we take from the nature. It is not about taking, using, throwing away. This is very linear. It is about thinking whether we have to produce something or maybe there is another way 
we can use a service instead of a product. Or when we produce something, the first question is, how are we going to design that? Because on that, everything else depends. Can we then repair it? Can we refurbish? Can we maintain it for longer than just, let's say, mobile phone for two years? Uh, and at the very end comes the recycling. So, so this is the concept of circular economy. And it is, of course, related to sustainability. As if, if we take sustainability and SDGs as a kind of umbrella, under which then we have the circular economy model, it works hand in hand. And absolutely uh, back to SDGs, for example, where we're talking about responsible consumption and responsible uh, production, this is exactly what we are solving by the circular economy uh, models. And uh, you asked me uh, about, yes, uh, how it resonates with the beekeepers uh, and with everything related to that. We have heard a lot today about the holistic approach, about systemic approach, about interdependency, interconnectivity. And I think bees are actually the symbol of that, of this mindset. And we humans are lacking this mindset. Uh, so uh, if we see also our economic system and our social system as something what is very connected, and the COVID crisis has shown us how vulnerable we are and how we depend on resources and uh, how, how we can suffer if we do not have access to these resources, then we understand why it is so important how we actually use these resources because they're limited and we can only operate within the planetary boundaries. And now to the um, beekeepers and everything related to that, what I find interesting is uh, wh when I'm observing or working with different organizations and companies is um, how, uh, how beekeepers are becoming an important stakeholder in different value chains. It's not only about producing honey as it used to be, or traditionally we think, aha, uh -huh, uh, that is the final product that we have but uh, how it is connected uh, also uh, to the production of, I have here an example of bio-based, um, it is instead of plastic folie that you would use, this is something what is very, um, very organic, made, you see the bee, uh, made um, of biodegradable material and then wax is put it over and you can pack uh, your sandwich in that and reuse it several times. So this is one product, for example, that is very much related with bees. And then we see in uh, the whole health sector, not only the products that are now for our immunity system, but also in tourism, like epitherapy, how we are recognizing this as something what is bringing peace to our mind and uh, also strengthening our immune system and on and on. And yeah, I will stop here because otherwise you cannot ask me questions, but I, I just wanted to show the variety of, um, of opportunities that we are finding within this system where circular economy is basically uh, the, the, yeah, the principle we are implementing. No, oh, thank you for for that very thoughtful answer, Ladea, and, and also for providing us that uh, visual aid there. That's a, a great tangible example. Um, <clears throat> I particularly, particularly liked um, your comparison of bees being the you know, original adopters for the, the circular economy model. Um, I think that's, that's a, a very good way to, to frame it in our own minds. Um, I was hoping you could, um, you know, for those of us who aren't economists, um, but, are, but are curious and are interested in, um, you know, looking into to conservation efforts for, for pollinators and, and otherwise. Um, I know the common refrain is often that, you know, these models and these efforts are come at a high financial cost. Um, is, there, is there any truth to that? And, uh, you know, what are the, the offsets or, or the costs for, you know, adopting these methods. Um, I'm not sure if you have any specific examples for, for pollinators per se, but, you know, if we were to, to mirror that, um, this approach in pollinators, I think it would be helpful to, to still hear, um, you know, these sustainability measures and employing the, the circular model of, you know, conservate, of, of <laughs> an economy geared towards, towards conservation and recycling and, 
and all of the uh, elements that you just described, you know, um, what are the you know, yeah. financial standards? I, I'm there? sure that pollinators would have great answer because and, uh, I'm not unfortunately a pollinator, but I know that we can learn from them a lot. And I will switch, yes, now to that, uh, to your uh, main question. So um, is it a cost and how much does it cost to shift towards circular economy? I would say how much is it going to cost us if we are not shifting towards circular economy? Uh, because we are facing the consequences of climate crisis and health crisis is directly related with a climate crisis. And it is not something what will pass only by vaccination. We will still have the problems and we will still face everything what climate crisis is uh, bringing us and showing us uh, that the way we are treating our planet and natural resources is not the right one. And we humans uh, have put it us in the position of the masters of the nature, but we are just part of the nature. And this is what we have heard from pollinators that they understand it very well. And in other industries, um, they're, they're coming to the similar conclusions. And uh, I, I like to say that still uh, money makes the world go round. Uh, and when the people and CEOs realize uh, that uh, not being circular is much more expensive than being circular, then they start this transition and even invest in, into this, um, into this uh, shift of the business model. Uh, and why, uh, why it works for them. Uh, I will take a concrete example because it's the easiest way to understand. Uh, for example, uh, Aquafil, this is the company that is producing nylon. So we would say, what does it have to do with circular economy? And years ago, their CEO, um, uh, Giulio Bonazzi, who is the diver and very related to the nature, uh, he said, okay, let's try to produce this nylon from something what already exists. So uh, let's make a recycled nylon. And what is a good idea? Oh, let's recycle fishing nets. And here comes the story. So once uh, you start this uh, very exciting journey towards circular economy, all of a sudden in your value chain, new actors appear. Before it was you bought a material, so and then you produced nylon from oil <laughs> directly. But now you have to collect fishing nets. While doing so, you get to those people who are fishers and they don't have the knowledge how to co collect these fishing nets. Then you realize that there are animals that are trapped in these fishing nets, uh, like turtles and so on. Then they called British Zoo. So the British Zoo educated the fishermen how to uh, save those animals and so on and so on. So you see that this journey is exciting. It is also costly at the very beginning, but at the end, what they managed really to do is to produce a new material. And this material has a high demand on the market because now we are looking for this kind of solutions and it is worth trying. So it is win-win-win situation at the very end. And we can find other examples. I just took this one because it's so obvious how this value chain has changed and how the material has been replaced with something new. And for the pollinators, uh, I would say there are so many uh, options or opportunities as well. If you're thinking about that, how you are going to pack your products. So uh, do you have to use, I don't know, plastic or do you have to use uh, every time uh, mm, uh, one, one packaging or you can go for refill. So this is also about changing habits. And here we come to the culture and here we come to the education, what we have heard before. So it is about working hand in hand um, and curating the same values. And that is how then we can jointly co-create also circular and sustainable solutions. Great, no, thank you so much for, for that example. I think that's that's very illustrative of, of the model and, and how it could play into, into the, the pollinators industry as well. Um, the you know, higher investment up front, but you know, leads to higher yields in the long run, um, as opposed to the traditional linear economy. I think that's very helpful to know. Um, thank you so much for, for your background and, and for your very thoughtful responses, Ladea. That was extremely thought provoking. Um, and as we let Matt finish up his B, um, I'm going to open up to the, the Q&A uh, section. But just because um, we're running a little bit low on time, I'm just going to do one 
maybe two questions. Um, and I'm going to open it up to whoever would like to answer it. I assume it would apply more directly to either Jamie or, or Abram, but it, if anyone would like to take a stab at it, feel free. Um, so this question comes to us through the chat box from Brooke, um, and she is asking whether any of um, our panelists today are currently working with or, or have worked with tribes or native nonprofits on B project projects, and in particular, if anyone has worked with indigenous American bees. So I can take a quick stab at this. Um, my team and I have worked with non-Apis bees as well. So Apis is the genus for honeybees. And so my team and I have worked uh, with other bees. Even here at the University of Florida, we have a pollinator ecologist who works with other bees. And I know many universities are doing something similar. It's very common these days to find someone who specializes on honeybees. That would be me in, my, in this case at UF but also someone who works specifically with native bees and native pollinators. And, and, and I think that there's a growing emphasis on that. I will tell you, there's way more folks who study that today than there were 15 years ago when I was hired at UF. And a lot of it was born out of this issue, recognizing pollinator crisis that's happening. Thank you, Jamie, that's, that's very helpful. It will, does anyone else have anything to add on that? No, okay. Great. Um, just one more question then quickly. Um, this question comes to us from Reza. She asks, the bee population in general is threatened, but however, do, does the competition have compound between uh, native and invasive bee, bee species? Does that play into uh, additional issues within colonies? I don't oh, want to hog all the answers, but I can take that if necessary, because <laughs> we've okay. this as well. Sure, so yeah. in the yeah, in, in the US, that's a compelling question because Apis mellifera, the honeybee, is not native. And so that question gets asked all the time, given that we have 2.7 million managed bee col honeybee colonies in the US. So there is some evidence that there are issues between managed bees and native bees. And, you know, as someone who works with honeybees, it'd be nice to be able to say that there's no impact of honeybees at all on native pollinators, but there's certainly a growing body of evidence that there are some interactions, perhaps disease and pest spread, competition for floral resources, et cetera. But I would argue it's not as straightforward as a lot of folks like to argue. Um, there's also evidence that there might be disease movement from native bees to honeybees. In fact, many of the diseases that honeybees have may have originated in native bee populations. So uh, the jury's still out. There's a growing body of uh, research looking at that. And I know in a lot of places such as Europe, uh, where honeybees are native, um, there's still efforts looking at, well, honeybees may be native, but they're also managed in high densities. How might that impact the native bee population? So it's a great growing body of research at the moment. So it's a very timely question because many, many folks are trying to address it. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Jamie. I think Abram had something that he would like to add. Yeah, just, just to add to that, um, you know, I think it, as Jamie mentioned, bringing the global perspective in, there's still so much, um, of a lack of monitoring that we have on, on bees and, and especially other wild pollinators. And there's one of the, the areas of work at the International Pollinators Initiative is monitoring research and also assessment. And um, one thing that's exciting is there, there are new tools coming out for citizen science, um, but you know also put attention on um, the IPBES, I-P-B-E-S, Pollinators Report, the seventh report that was released. If you look at it, most of the data that we have on bees and pollinators and their decline and their drivers, it's mostly from the global north. It's mostly from North America and Europe. And if you look where, where the data is lacking, huge needs for data, um, South America, Latin and South America, Africa, and Asia. So um, we really um, have a big need for that. And I think to just to say something about the last question, I don't know in particular about indigenous groups working in North America, but um, in that IPES report, they did they do a good job of really outlining what they call multiple knowledge systems and um, bringing together, like we talked about that indigenous local knowledge uh, with the science to create an evidence. So they have a framework that it best uses quite a bit. And if you look online for that, the multiple 
um, knowledge and, and evidence bases on that. It's a great starting point for thinking about co-creation and for, for you know, furthering the research, the citizen science, to try to get more data where the data is lacking so we can make better decisions. Thank you, Abram, and thank you, Jamie, also for, for your thoughtful answers um, to these very important questions. I'm, I'm glad we were able to get to those as well. Um, since we're already a little bit over time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out the question and answer section, but you know, feel free to uh, still post them in the chat and perhaps the panelists will be able to uh, take a look or, or we can take a look afterwards. Um, but perhaps we can connect with someone out from the chat box who's also joining and knows the answer. Um, we'll now turn back to Matt and to take a look at this gorgeous bee that he has been so lovingly constructing for us. Let's get a close up of, of this bee right here, if we can. If you'd be able to, um, if there's anything you'd like to share, any, any closing remarks from, from you and the bee, Matt, we'd be happy to hear those. I just thought this was a great event. Thank you to everybody who is continuing to share the story. It's so different. I'm, you know, I've been doing this since 2015 and I came into this world of ease completely clueless, like a blank slate. And I, there is a marked difference in the knowledge and the way that we all present this story that is fantastic to witness. It's really works. I see the message getting carried beautifully these days. So. And if anybody, I just thought in case anybody's curious, they want to check out thegoodofthehive.com. You can see all the other 32 murals. There's one at the National Zoo um, if you're in DC and you know they're, they're, they're all over the world and, and continuing. So follow along on the journey. That's it, thanks. Perfect, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for um, all of your hard work on, on your painting today. We're, we're very honored. <laughs> Absolutely to have been, you know, a small part of this beautiful mural. Um, thank you again. Um, so now, um, at that, after that grand reveal, we are going to turn to closing remarks from our panel, who will each have a minute to summarize their key takeaways from the event today. Um, John, just because you're first on my screen, I will let you go first. Okay. Um, yes. Um, I, if, uh, if, if you are interested in becoming a beekeeper, find a class to take. Uh, there are many things to learn and to and understand to be successful. Uh, you can keep bees almost anywhere. Uh, I visited a gentleman who had a hive on his apartment balcony. <laughs> However, not every place is a good location. You will need to consider the area and the flight path of the bees first. So go out and be an advocate, advocate for the honeybee. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Ladea, if you'd like to go next. Okay, yeah, I have learned a lot and I have realized that you are not beekeepers, but actually bee carers, because you are taking care of bees and also of the community. So this is my message, uh, my lesson learned. And I'm inviting everyone, of course, uh, to join us at Circular Change and explore the opportunities for collaboration, because as it has been said, we are the best entry point for your circular economy journey, and we are learning from bee carers a lot. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you so much, Ladea. Jamie, we'll, we'll go to you next. Sure, Elena, I have a few points I'd like to make. Number one, the world population is growing. We're going to have to feed more people with the same amount of land. So smart agriculture is needed and a key component of that is pollination. In many systems, pollinator dependent systems especially, pollination is, an important, is as important an input as fertilization is, as pest control is, et cetera. Pollination is key. Number two, we actually have the ability to address this issue. We can do it. Pollinators can be protected. We have the skill set to do it, and it's just waiting to be done. Number three, I'm really optimistic that the future is bright. Uh, the work that's being done, the up-and-coming scientists, the collaborations between industry and government partners will bring this to fruition. And the fourth and final point that I want to make 
is given everything that I've said, we've got to feed more people with the same amount of land. Pollination is important. We have the ability to address it. The future is bright. I think the key component at this point is we have to work together. We have to recognize this common goal, this common vision. We have to have the desire to address this issue. And then we have to do it. We have to do it the way honeybees would do it, working together to achieve a common goal. And I'm optimistic it can be done. And this is not just one of those things that we'll talk about, but we'll actually address. And I look at the participant list, I look at the panelists, and I'm, I'm just encouraged that it can be done. Well said. Thank you. Abram, if you'd like to deliver the closing, closing remark. <laughs> uh, yeah, just very quickly. Um, I didn't even mention much about it, but uh, for more information, if you look up FAO's pollination website, it's chock full of resources. Um, we've cataloged pollinator plans of action and policies from across the world. There are, um, there, there's even guidebooks on, on how do you economically value pollinators, not just bees, but pollinators. So it's chock full of, of resources. And I think, you know, to bring it back around uh, again, uh, as the Food and Agriculture Organization, I, I just want to stress again to think about the food that you're eating. Think about how it was produced, how it may have been dependent on, on bees and other pollinators to produce it, and uh, give thanks to them for, for the nutrition and the bounty of the food that we have. It's been great being here with you today. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. All incredibly important and uh, poignant concepts addressed by each of you in your, in your closing remarks and in your thoughts on the panel. Um, on behalf of FAO North America and the Slovenian Embassy of the United States, I would just like to thank all of our panelists, speakers, and participants today and everyone who, who joined us for this very robust discussion and webinar today. Um, again, the live stream will be shared with all of you um, who joined us today afterwards and feel free to check out FAO North America and the Slovenian uh, Embassy on Twitter or our websites to get more information on bees or on World Bee Day. Um, we look forward to, to seeing you all again soon and thank you all for, for your participation and have a great World Bee Day. <laughs>